years here uh, with the physiology course and in other capacities uh, have been supported by the generosity of others, including, including many of you in the audience, uh, both through your general support uh, and specific support uh, for various programs here at the MBL. So um, we're not finished yet with a season of uh, scientific exchange and inquiry, uh, but this is our fi final Friday lecture. So thank you all for being a part of this community, contributing to uh, both the exchange of ideas uh, and also the sustenance of, of this tradition of exchange. So with that, uh, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Nipam Patel, the director of the Marine Biological Laboratory. Thanks, Sebastian. So as Sebastian said, you know, it's a pleasure to welcome you all to the final Friday evening lecture of the season, but far from the end of the summer, thankfully. So we've still got lots of beautiful weather and the MBL campus is still very much full of students and exciting research going on and we're really pleased to see that. And it's really a great pleasure to introduce today Dan Fletcher. So Dan is a professor of bioengineering and biophysics at UC Berkeley. And Dan and I have been close colleagues at Berkeley for a number of years. And it's very nice that even though now I'm here at the MBL, Dan is also here being part of the physiology course. So it's nice to be able to stay in touch. So Dan got his undergraduate degree at Princeton and then um, spent a little time as a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford and then got his PhD at Stanford. And um, he's been at Berkeley probably close to 20 years now. And um, Dan's research work is you know, fantastic. So he's pioneered a lot of studies in mechanical forces at the nanoscale. So he's very interested in that sort of basic biology of how cell membranes have forces on them, what it does to them, and the same with the cytoskeleton. And that's taken Dan in some really fascinating directions of making quantitative measurements, much of it through very advanced microscopy. And that's part of how Dan and I connected at Berkeley as we were part of an imaging initiative there. But the other side of Dan's work, if, 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 in a sense it's very much related, but you know, it's what I think he's gonna talk about most of the day, is kind of the other end of imaging. So you know, Nowadays, we have more and more sophisticated microscopes that have you know, hundreds, if not millions of dollars of parts in them and things like that. But it is actually also amazing the kind of microscopy that you can do on the cheap. You know, so you can build basically a nice microscope and now with the incredible power of the cameras in your cell phones, you can actually do some pretty nice imaging. I mean, sometimes it's kind of an odd thing. I still, it drives me crazy in the courses when the students, you know, there's a $5,000 camera on the microscope and the student puts their cell phone up to the eyepiece and takes a picture and you're like, what are you doing? And of course the reason is, is because they say, well, I can get it onto Twitter and Facebook faster this way than I can if I take a picture. But the reality is, you get a pretty good picture actually. And so what Dan has been able to do is to really use that kind of, in a sense, low end, low cost, imaging to really actually make improvements in human health. And so that's been a, a, a you know, fascinating thing to watch as Dan has worked on that. And um, that's obviously, hopefully we'll hear some about that. Um, Dan's other honors include being director of the physiology course. And despite that, Dan and I are still friends. And, uh, <laughs> but then he's also, he was also a, a White House fellow during the Obama administration. He's had numerous other honors. He's like a, you know, young movers and shakers in popular science and so on. And so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dan. All right, thank you uh, very much, uh, Nipon, for that kind introduction. And it's a pleasure uh, to, to work with a physiology course, um, a year older than the embryology course. I don't know if any of you knew that, um, but. Um, it's also just a great pleasure to be uh, here at MBL. I was here earlier in the summer and got a chance to come back. And this is always a place where I feel like I can really let my hair down and really enjoy, uh, enjoy this environment. Um, uh, so uh, this is the last Friday evening lecture and I, I had the pleasure of coming to the first several of the Friday evening lectures. 
And it's a wonderful chance for the community to come together and to hear a little bit about science, but uh, for me, a chance to, to step back a little bit and think about where science is going, where some of the technologies are going that we might be uh, interacting with in the future. Um, uh, and the physiology course and MBL in general it has always been a place that I look forward to in the summer because it's a chance to do something new, a chance to experience something new. And one of the things I experienced uh, this summer that was new uh, was, was COVID. Um, so I, I hadn't had COVID, um, but I came to the MBL, a place of new experiences, and I got COVID. Um, so this was a, a chance both to feel uh, biology firsthand, you know, feel that infection cycle, understand how it went through me. Um, but this is often the environment that many of us faced uh, early on in the pandemic, was looking at uh, our own health and thinking about, am I sick? Um, and lining up on uh, many long lines to get a nasal swab. And if you went particularly early in the pandemic, they, they took those really long uh, swabs and tried to get a piece of the brain. Um, and it was based on that uh, that they would evaluate uh, the, uh, whether or not you had uh, COVID. But those results often came very late. Um, they came very late in the sense that you would wait 24, maybe 48 hours before you knew whether or not uh, you had COVID. Um, and so that, that time period of waiting left us unclear about what exactly to do. Should we interact? Should we not interact? And part of the reason it took so long is your sample didn't stay right there at the testing site. It went to some laboratory where automated equipment would carry out several steps and eventually go through the amplification that many of our students are doing up in the labs uh, to evaluate whether or not that little fragment of RNA from the viral genome was there. Um, this is an example of one of those automated facilities. This was actually set up in the, uh, on the Berkeley campus at the Innovative Genomics Institute. And this ran uh, most of the samples that were collected on the Berkeley campus. Um, and we relied on this uh, to know whether or not we were, it was safe for us to come back to campus, whether we were allowed to come back to campus. But still, uh, the delays meant that we weren't necessarily making the best decisions about what to do with our, with our time. Should we go to work? Should we not go to work? Could we come in? Could we not? Nowadays, and when I was here this summer, um, I confirmed my suspicions that my runny nose and my achy feeling was indeed COVID you know, with one of these. So we now have access to rapid tests, which allow us to know within 15 minutes whether we have the most obvious signs of COVID. But that typically is a confirmatory test. Um, most people are a little suspicious already that they've got this achy feeling, this sickness, and so what is it that, uh, that, that I have? Uh, and uh, the challenge is that sometimes we don't necessarily know even after a rapid test. Um, what if it's negative, but you still feel sick? Um, what if you had uh, COVID and you're waiting to see, does that little line disappear? Which is what I spent most of my time doing. Waiting, do I really see it? What if I hold it in a light? Um, now I can't see it. Does that mean I can go back to the course? I don't know. Uh, so a lot of times we spend during this pandemic is asking the question, um, what do I have? And that's a question that we ask more now than I think we did before the pandemic. Um, not because we have more illnesses now than before, but because we realize that there is the capacity to get an answer and to get an answer in a shorter time frame than we might be used to. Um, in the past, if I felt sick, I assumed it was a flu, a cold, who knows what, doesn't matter. Nowadays, I, I wonder specifically, well, you know, the treatment would be a little different for each of these. Uh, my risk of infecting someone else is a little different for each of these. So what I want to tell you about is, uh, is essentially a side project in lab aimed at understanding how we can use mobile phones to, to answer this question of what do I have? And it's based around mobile phones because these are becoming, if they're not already, some of our most advanced equipment uh, in our homes, uh, in, in our offices, in our labs even. Um, the amount of computational power, uh, the imaging power um, is tremendous for the package size. And the possibility of using what has been developed 
to meet the needs of so many people, not the needs, maybe the desires of so many people to take uh, higher resolution photographs of family members, uh, to take images in the dark. Uh, that was one of the advertising campaigns for Samsung a few years ago was this new low light camera, uh, high sensitivity camera would allow you to take a photo in a closet. Um, and you know the ad had some suggestions about why you might want to do that. But that is, uh, that is precisely what you need for the kind of microscopy that happens here at the MBL and in many biology labs around the world, is taking high sensitivity, high resolution images. So how can we uh, take advantage of that? So let me rewind and uh, tell you a little bit about how I got interested in this, uh, in this field. Um, and it really was from the perspective of uh, neglected tropical diseases. So these are diseases that are typically not ones that we experience. Um, here is a, a, a collection of the, the, the diseases that fall into that category. And these are uh, covered by a, a, a affecting about 1.7 billion people and, and growing in some regions. Um, and most of these diseases have been eliminated from the places that we live, from the places that we work, or the places that we travel. And so they're neglected in the sense that they're not foremost in our minds, and they don't garner a lot of attention uh, in terms of medical resources um, or funding for elimination and eradication. But these are, uh, on the one hand, uh, terrible uh, diseases that do degrade quality of life, even though they don't capture the headlines like Ebola. Uh, these are diseases that are chronic, typically, and, uh, and cause a person to have a less productive, um, a less full life. But they are also fascinating from the biological perspective because these are what I would consider to be the more advanced of the pathogens. Um, uh, COVID or Ebola or those that, that flare up, um, cause severe harm to their host and move on uh, are not ones that are going to persist all that long. Yes, the pandemic, I guess, is not really over yet, but at some point it hopefully will be. These are parasites that have been living with human hosts for uh, decades, centuries, millennia. And that's because they've figured out how to kind of coexist which makes them much harder to eliminate and has allowed them to continue um, in some parts of the world. So how can uh, we address problems like this, both uh, medically, but also hopefully learn something uh, biologically? Now, the prevalence of, of these diseases is focused in uh, lower resource environments, places where uh, the healthcare institutions are not as robust, where not as much funding is available for uh, treatment. And the color code is for uh, different numbers of these neglected tropical diseases um, that are present. Now, uh, uh, about um, a decade ago, uh, there was a, a meeting called the London uh, Declaration on Neglected Tropical Diseases. And this was an effort um, by the WHO, by the Gates Foundation, and a whole range of other partners to come together around a solution. Um, a way of eliminating or controlling this list of 10 neglected tropical diseases. And uh, a, a major part of that was identifying the drugs that were going to be necessary um, or important for eliminating these diseases. But a, a particularly challenging part of that, uh, that London Declaration was finding the people who needed these medicines. Many of the medicines needed to treat neglected diseases are available, but finding the individuals who actually need to take those medicines is challenging, so a diagnostic challenge. Um, and so much like us, when we have COVID or a flu or a cold or some other ailment, um, we uh, think, what do I have? That's the same question that many in developing regions have, but there are many fewer ways to get that answer. There is not a clinic around the corner that you can uh, provide a blood sample and get an answer. There's, there's not a, a doctor who can do um, a quick test, send it to the lab, and get a result back. So this question is even more urgent in some ways to answer in these developing regions um, where there is such limited uh, access and where these diseases are, are neglected. Now, I've called them neglected um, because that's the name generally give, given to them. Um, but they're not always uh, neglected. Um, so take uh, schistosomiasis, which is uh, caused by, uh, by worms in the uh, schistosoma uh, family. It turns out uh, that 
um, there is a heavy metal band uh, named uh, Schistosoma. Um, it's a death metal band. Um, and so they are raising the profile of uh, this, this disease. Now, it turns out that there are, there are five members of the, the band, and you can actually find this on Spotify if you're interested. Um, and they're actually, uh, you know, Schistosoma is the genus. Um, so one might wonder, well, what's the species? Uh, well, there are five different species of, uh, of Schistosoma. So presumably that's why there are five members of this band. So I think they are doing a good job of, of trying to raise the profile, but I don't think we can leave it to uh, the heavy metal community uh, to solve this problem. So how else could we tackle uh, these diseases and raise their profile and at least come up with solutions that can help with the goal of elimination? So uh, an alternate approach is to uh, increase the ability to use microscopy. So for many diseases, uh, being able to see the causative agent of the disease is and has been the way you diagnose someone. Um, so a few examples. Um, uh, use of the humble light microscope to, and some staining will allow you to identify the presence of tuberculosis uh, bacterium, bacterium that caused tuberculosis in a sputum sample. Um, if you look at a red blood cell and you see the plasmodium parasite inside of it, you see DNA inside of a red blood cell, then you've got malaria. And uh, the same with trypanosomes. If you have them, uh, if you see them in your blood sample, then you've got trypanosomiasis. And so that's been the way to diagnose people. You look for the, the bug, the parasite, the thing that causes the disease, and that's how you know. But having people who know how to use microscopes and even having the microscopes themselves and having the sample preparation protocols is, is limited um, in many parts of the country. So even microscopy, where it is used, um, it's not always available to people who are in need. Now, microscopes, um, as Nippon pointed out, are, are really a, a workhorse for many labs. And um, uh, this summer, actually, in the physiology course, we got the chance to work with Leica's latest uh, uh, microscope. So I'm, I'm putting it up here because thank you, Leica, for donating to the course. We really enjoyed your microscope. Um, but they have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, um, and they now fill rooms. This one was definitely room-sized with large screens, uh, big uh, rolling uh, light sources, uh, and they can do amazing, amazing things. Uh, but uh, th these kinds of microscopes really are, are advancing our understanding, and we rely on them. Um, a few of the projects that we work on on the other side of lab, the one that looks more at the molecular mechanisms, we need these kind of advanced microscopes to understand how influenza is able to move in a directional way. Um, Mike Vahey discovered that the spatial polarization of the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase on the, uh, the, the virus allowed it to undergo a kind of ratcheting behavior in uh, a mucus or on a sialic acid surface. Um, uh, Carmen Chan used similar light microscopy, high resolution, to observe that uh, a different virus is able to hijack the actin cytoskeleton to drive a cell that it infects to fuse with a neighboring cell, thereby giving it a larger space in which to replicate. Um, we wouldn't be able to see that if it weren't for the advances in microscopy that, uh, that have, have, have come from constant development, constant pushing to get better features, more contrast. Um, similar types of microscopy were needed to understand that the way in which our immune cells identify objects to phagocytose um, depend on the actual size of those molecules. How tall is a molecule on a cell surface? That actually matters to the macrophage who's looking at a target that is antibody uh, uh, labeled. Um, should I eat it, should I not? It depends on the height of the, of the molecule. And then how, well, how do we actually measure that height? It turns out you can use optical microscopy, basically super resolution twice, to make a measurement of separation that allows that, uh, that, that measure of height. So advanced microscopes, we're, we're very much interested in them and love them, but they're not always necessary. Um, like uh, Nipom says about taking a, a photo through the eyepiece of something that a scope like this is producing. Um, similarly, if you are looking at something with this scope that you could also look at with that, uh, that, that high school scope that you worked with, 
this one just isn't necessary. And it's a good reminder that the earliest microscopes uh, were not room-sized. In fact, the earliest microscopes were uh, handheld, um, not too different in size from the rapid tests that we now take. And the real, the business end of this microscope is that little divot there at the top um, where uh, a polished glass bead was mounted. Um, and this was held up to a light source. And uh, if you look through it, put it uh, right distance away from your eye, you can see uh, things that look to your eye like they're magnified 250 times. Um, and that's what Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek was able to do, is observe these microorganisms, which he called animalcules, a very good name, uh, that, that unfortunately didn't stick. Um, maybe we can change the uh, uh, microbiology uh, course to animalcule course. But um, so, th so these microscopes r reinforce the idea that you don't need the, the, the latest and greatest technology to make simple uh, measurements of objects, simple observations of the organization, the structure of objects. And maybe you can even get enough information that you could diagnose what is in a sample. Now let's bring in mobile phones. Um, so some of you hopefully remember that there was a time when we didn't have soap mobile phones. Um, and that was uh, further to the left. <clears throat> and then we went through a period of mobile phones that were just phones. Um, I remember that period, um, especially because my sister got a phone that had a camera on it. And I was amazed. Uh, my phone did not have a camera on it. But I thought it was really silly because uh, you know, it's, a, it's a cute camera. It's a cute feature. But um, um, I was buying you know, very expensive cameras for my lab. And that, uh, those are going to take much better images. But over the years, the camera quality has improved and improved. And driving around the Bay Area uh, during those days, during those times, you would see these giant billboards with photos that were taken by cell phones. And the idea was that uh, the, the photo is so amazing, um, the quality was so high, the contrast was so good, that it looks good even on a billboard. I haven't seen as many billboards with uh, images from, from a physiology course, though I think we should change that. Um, beautiful images uh, uh, on billboards, but I don't know how many microscopes that would sell. It definitely sells phones because the image quality and the capabilities of the camera, and even the number of cameras, continues to be a driver for new generations of phones. And some of you who have upgraded recently Possibly the camera quality is one thing that you considered in making your decision. So the ability to uh, capture images with phones um, uh, uh, suggested an idea during a class that I was teaching. So I teach an undergraduate class on optics and, um, and microscopy, so basic physics of light and imaging systems and how we use that in microscopy. And uh, in this course, um, uh, to try and make it a little bit more relevant to today, um, I wanted to know, uh, I wanted to have as a semester project, could we take a mobile phone that can take a picture of something big, like a tree, and can we add some lenses onto it that would convert that image um, into something that could take a picture of something small? small? So leave the camera and the lenses, everything intact in the phone, but just bolt something on that would allow you to uh, take microscopic images. And so that was a good design problem for the class. And at the end of that, we ended up not being able to find one available. Um, so some students went and built one. Um, and this was our, our first uh, mobile phone microscope. We called it a cell scope because we were trying to look at cells. And you can tell how old it is because uh, the phone here is from a company called Nokia. And they, they used to make really, really good cameras, really good phones. And I, I haven't seen them around as much now. Um, but the design of this was a relatively simple combination of essentially an eyepiece lens and an objective um, in a straight line and uh, a holder for a slide at the end. But even with that simple configuration, basically, considering the mobile phone lens to be very much like our eye. We can look at big things, and we make them small onto our retina. Same thing that the camera lens does is makes a big thing small onto, our, uh, onto the CMOS sensor in the camera. So even with this simple configuration, um, we were able to take images uh, that look like this. So this is a blood smear. Um, uh, nothing particularly fancy about it, uh, but it's 
clear that you can tell the morphology of the blood cells. You can see um, in this stained sample uh, the presence of a, of a white blood cell. So you can start to, to make very rudimentary counts of white cells and red cells and platelets. Um, that kind of basic information without needing a more complicated system, uh, even a fancier microscope. What was particularly um, interesting at that time was uh, we could stick an LED on the other side of that microscope and capture images that look like this. So these are um, uh, acridine orange stained uh, red blood cells that are infected by malaria. And so the little uh, bright spots you see here, uh, those are uh, malaria parasites. And again, even with this really simple configuration, um, uh, transillumination fluorescence, which is a no-no for anyone doing fluorescence microscopy. You always do epifluorescence, not like this. But even like this was, was good enough for the kinds of images we wanted to take. Now, one of the main problems and barriers at that time was we still needed an objective. Um, and for those of you who are uh, working with microscopes or uh, get requests from students to buy an objective, you know that they can range up to $15,000, even $20,000 for a highly corrected uh, uh, immersion objective. Now, of course, we don't need something that advanced, but there's a, there's a certain limited amount of, of use of, of objectives, and so the volumes are not high, and so the costs remain pretty high. But this is the kind of complexity that objectives can have, multiple elements, uh, have to be spaced precisely and um, relatively robust. So how is it that we would be able to use a mobile phone to do microscopy without using one of these objectives? Well, the answer comes from the development of mobile phone lenses. Um, I don't know if you've ever popped the lens out of your uh, phone, uh, maybe not intentionally, but if you did, uh, you might notice that that lens group is a, is a set of individual lenses that are uh, coupled together. And in some lenses, in some mobile phone lenses, there can be seven or eight elements. And that's rivaling the number of elements that are present uh, in microscope objectives. And that's because at th these cameras are deciding whether you get uh, a Google phone or an Apple phone or a Samsung phone. So a lot of work goes into making those images as uh, high quality as possible. So um, it, it turns out that this lens, we don't want to pop it out of our phone. We want to leave the phone intact. If you uh, take another one of those lenses and simply flip it around, you end up creating a one-to-one -one imaging system, which allows you to resolve things on the micron scale. So this is something that a uh, student in the lab at the time, Neil Switz, uh, figured out um, and set up very quickly, and we realized Aha, that is the kind of system that we can use to make a mobile phone microscope very compact and very useful um, outside of the lab. And the basic system is this, take the intact phone, you've got already a lens that is, uh, that is designed to image things at infinity or a little bit closer than infinity. And if you turn around another lens and put it in place, you've got this one-to-one -one imaging system. Now you may be thinking to yourself, uh, 1x, that's not a very good uh, microscope. So the important thing to remember is that the magnification um, is to the sensor and not to your eye. The sensor has pixels that are spaced on the micron scale, actually below a micron now. Um, and a micron is a hundredth the diameter of a hair. And so you have the ability to capture spatial information um, on that micron scale at 1x, because you're essentially taking your sensor and placing it on top of your sample. And so for any object that has features that are larger than a micron, this sort of configuration can resolve it. Um, in, in fact, the, uh, the, if you, for, the, for the aficionados, um, you know, this is a non-telecentric imaging system, which means that your, your magnification depends on your, uh, your, your focal position. And um, this imaging, the resolution uh, that you could obtain because of the, the lens numerical aperture is actually higher than the sensor. So we're actually pixel limited in terms of the information collection. There's more information coming in the lens. So as the sensor, as the pixel densities get smaller and smaller, this sort of configuration will continue to gather more information. So with this reversed lens system, we wanted to come back and see if we could tackle one of these problems. 
Now, the problem of onchocerciasis is not one that I had heard of before, uh, but a colleague uh, by the name of uh, Tom Nutman at the NIH uh, called me up and said, hey, uh, you've got this uh, portable microscope. Uh, we've got a problem in the treatment of river blindness. Um, maybe this could help. And so this was uh, one of those things that, uh, uh, you know, you have no funding for. Um, you, it's, a, it's kind of a side project, but it just seems like it would be really interesting to do. And so we set off to try and explore whether or not the tools that we were building could help with the problem uh, of, of river blindness. So let me explain that um, briefly. So river blindness, as the name suggests, is a disease that can lead to blindness um, and is prevalent uh, in, uh, in Central and West Africa. Um, it's the river part of it is because the vector which spreads this particular disease lives near uh, water sources. Um, uh, about 37 million people are still infected with, uh, with onchocerciasis, and it can lead to permanent blindness as well as a range of other uh, conditions, uh, itching, uh, etc. Um, it's actually memorialized uh, in the WHO headquarters in Geneva. This statue is of a younger person leading an older person who's gone blind uh, because of onchocerciasis. Now, the, the good news is that Onchocerciasis can be treated by the drug ivermectin, which some of you may be familiar with uh, because that is a drug that is given to dogs for heartworm. Um, known as Mectazan, the Mectazan donation program, which started in 1987, um, uh, uh, provided as much uh, a Mectazan or ivermectin as needed to eliminate uh, this, this, this worm. Now, the drug acts on the microfilaria, so the, the worms that are wiggling around and are, can be found in blood samples. Uh, it doesn't actually kill the adult worm. The adult worm can live for 10, 12, 15 years. Um, so the, you have to keep giving this ivermectin to kill the, the, uh, the microfilaria, prevent transmission, um, but, and wait, essentially, for the adult worm uh, to die. Uh, but it was found in the uh, late 1990s that uh, people were, were actually having uh, experiencing severe adverse events, which is the clinical way of saying uh, they were dying or having serious neurological problems as a result of ivermectin. So ivermectin, incredibly safe, um, uh, an amazing drug in many ways. Uh, but it turns out in, in populations that were co-infected with another uh, worm called Loa Loa, if you had too many worms, um, the risk, this is on the y-axis, axis, the, the risk of having a severe adverse event goes up as the uh, number of worms that are present in a blood sample goes up. So there's some threshold, and that threshold is about 20,000 worms uh, per mil. And so those of you who know what a, like a mil is, imagine 20,000 uh, worms, little microfilaria that are couple hundred microns long, 10 microns in diameter, um, wiggling around. And, and people are alive and, and survive, uh, but it, it, it leads to some complications. But if you treat with ivermectin, those worms, those microfilaria die, and the onchocerca, uh, the onchocerca uh, microfilaria die, and you have too many things dying at once, you get uh, uh, a massive response from the immune system, and that leads to these, uh, these severe adverse events. And so these are the culprits. These are the low, low microfilaria that are wiggling around. So they, these have been taken from a blood sample and the uh, blood, blood's been separated. So you can see the wiggling of the worms. So you know, if, they, if they weren't in people, these are you know, quite beautiful, the, the wiggling of uh, dancing of these worms. Um, but the fact that they are in people is, is, is the problem. But how do we identify that they're there? The standard way is to do the uh, bright field microscopy with a stain. You, you find someone with a microscope, you uh, take a blood sample, you do a thick smear, you stain it, you dry it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, a long process, a standard process, but you need to then have someone who knows what he or she is looking for, then read the slide back and forth and back and forth. And that's simply not practical to do um, for every individual who needs to be treated. And so we uh, investigated an alternative approach, uh, wiggling worms, Maybe we don't even need to separate them from whole blood. Maybe we could just observe them in the whole blood. So this is actually a movie of whole blood playing. And I want to see if you can tell if there's any worms present. Anyone see any, any worms? 
It's a little hard to see, but it is a, it is a video playing, and I know where to look so I can see it. Um, but we can do very simple image processing to reveal the presence and the locations of those worms. So this is essentially difference imaging, uh, taking a few frames, averaging them to reduce the noise, taking a few more frames, averaging them to reduce the noise, and then subtracting them. And then you see where there are hot spots of activity, hot spots of, of motion. And this is in a confined geometry, which is why they're actually translating as opposed to just thrashing around. But without doing any sample preparation, without staining, um, simply by watching them and doing some uh, analysis of those images, we can identify the presence of those, of those worms. So this was an application for this re reversed lens microscope that could go into a field um, and we added to it the ability to automatically collect um, a, automatically take a capillary, this is the capillary tube, uh, move that capillary tube underneath uh, the imaging system so that there's one degree of motion rather than scanning a slide in two, two dimensions, which mechanically is a much more complex stage. This is a very simple linear stage, sweeping it underneath the field of view. The width of this is one field of view of that imaging system. And we can then collect a series of images, enough uh, images to make a statistical argument about how many worms were present in solution. So this is the de device that uh, Matt Bacalar, Mike D'Ambrasio, Dan Friedman, and a whole host of other students developed uh, to address this, this solution. Um, so once the, the images had been scanned, um, the capillary is ejected, and in the background, uh, the images are being processed. And this was all in an app that Matt wrote. It just so happens it was a hidden talent of his. He was working on a totally different project, but he knew how to write apps, and so voila, uh, he was able to put an app together. Uh, and that uh, allowed us to uh, integrate this whole solution. A little capillary to collect blood, um, uh, this app that would control the motion of the of the capillary, and then this very compact imaging system, which had sufficient resolution to, uh, to, to be able to analyze the motion of these worms. So this now is, is, has been in use, is in use um, in, uh, uh, in Cameroon. This is where we were doing testing with partners there and, and in France. Um, and it's now been used on maybe 80,000 people. Uh, and that means that in certain regions where uh, treatment of river blindness had been stopped because they didn't know who might have too many of these other worms present, um, that treatment can now begin again. And so people can now receive ivermectin um, if they have been tested to make sure that they don't have too much of this loa loa, too many uh, microfilaria in blood. Now, this kind of uh, system is really not designed just for one worm. Again, it is just an imaging system, a really simple imaging system in that respect. And so we began to, to wonder if there were other diseases, similar diseases, that could, be, uh, that could take advantage of the same sort of imaging system, the same sort of automation. Um, and so we, uh, uh, this was the one we've been working on, Loa Loa. This is a, a phylogeny of, of uh, the sequences uh, based on the sequence of a number of different, uh, both roundworms and flatworms. Um, that's where we, we started. And um, over the last few years, we've been trying to expand the number of worms that we we're able to, to identify with this system. And so these are the ones that we're now working on. And we're able to do that because, uh, thanks to the Gates Foundation, we built a new device. This is the next generation device. That first one was literally put together in lab with the, uh, with the intent of using it for about six months. And now, five years later, it's still in use. And that's a problem because it was not designed to be used uh, for very long. Uh, but we've now uh, designed one that is more robust, um, that addresses the river blindness problem, that now we think can be useful for lymphatic filariasis. Um, a set of other worms where we don't look at the wiggling of the worms, but rather look at the eggs that are produced and come out in urine or stool samples um, are schistosomiasis and soil transmitted helminths. And so if I can get in touch with this band, maybe I can get their help in uh, fundraising for these capillaries that we need to, uh, to, to work with this device. And all you need to do is change the capillary to capture the eggs as opposed to capture the worm. Um, and the future direction is in thinking about not imaging, but light collection. 
uh, if you think about the types of laboratory instruments that we use most to do molecular biology and cell biology, most of them, many of them, um, uh, collect light in one form or another, whether it's a fluorimeter, a spectrophotometer, a microscope, uh, many reactions that uh, are designed to tell us something, um, RT-PCR, are based on light collection. And a phone is just a fancy version of a light collector. It does a lot of light collection in a spatially organized way, and that gives us the image. But we can do light collection by simply summing up the intensities from all the pixels. Um, and that is, is something, uh, the work that we uh, did uh, during COVID to try and think of how could we address the problem of not getting precise enough answers fast enough. These give us answers, but usually not at the, the early days of infection. They're more a confirmatory uh, test. How can we do something like PCR, but do that in a much more rapid uh, context? And so uh, working with the, the laboratories of uh, Melanie Ott at the Gladstone Institute and my colleague Jennifer Doudna at Berkeley, um, we used one of the CRISPR enzymes, Cas13, to do what we call a direct detection assay. Now, what's amazing about this particular enzyme, Cas13A, is that it, is a, uh, uh, it, it directly detects the presence of a particular sequence of RNA. So if you give it a guide RNA, it will look for that matching uh, target RNA, and then it becomes a random nucleus. It will cut any RNA that's present in the system. So the way to turn that into a sensor is to add in a fluorophore quencher pair that is normally dark or dark-ish. And when um, a single copy of the uh, target is present in that solution, um, that fluorophore quencher uh, pair begins to get cut. So the enzyme turns on, it starts cutting, and you get increasing fluorescence in a sample. Um, and so that uh, increasing fluorescence can be picked up by a mobile phone um, with a little filter in front of it. And so that's what we uh, demonstrated in this little box that uh, this was the earlier version. Was this a Google, I think a Pixel 4. Um, this phone uh, was, it was actually an order of magnitude more sensitive than the TCAN plate reader um, where the, the guide work was initially done. And, and the reason for that, uh, if, for those of you who've spent you know, tens of thousands of dollars, if not $50,000 on your TCAN, um, it's still a good instrument. I don't mean to undermine that. Uh, but there's some advantages to being able to, uh, to average uh, the intensities. The, the multiple pixels allow you to average um, within a given sample uh, to, to get the noise down. And the way we call a positive in this assay is to look at the slope the reaction is basically a michaelis menten reaction. You increase fluorescence. Um, uh, that slope is based on the number of copies that are present in solution, uh, and you distinguish it from a negative control. And so the noise in the measurement is a key property of being able to separate the two. And so averaging among the pixels allows us to reduce that noise. Now, we've been able to make a version of this um, that, uh, that, is, that is actually uh, uh, comparable to PCR uh, without any amplification. Uh, so there's no uh, reverse transcription. There's no amplification. We can directly read out the copies of the virus in, uh, uh, in a sample once it's been released from, uh, from, the, the viral, uh, from the virus itself. So to me, this uh, emphasizes the, the, the power that mobile phones can have, uh, the sensitivity, uh, the quality, the ability to do image processing on the phones, uh, the GPUs that are coming online uh, to, to accelerate the processing of that information. Um, these can be workhorses um, in, for the future. Um, and we're now uh, expanding to other uh, virions and starting to, to think about um, other markers that we can look at for disease in a, in a simple system like this. Now, I've talked about molecular diagnostics, um, uh, but uh, thinking about healthcare, we don't always jump to the molecule. Uh, if you uh, are, are suspicious of something, um, I guess the first step is usually look it up online. That I, uh, my you know, doctors have told me they don't like that because patients come in fully convinced they have X, Y, and Z when when maybe they don't. Um, 
But initially, uh, primary care would involve making typical measurements you would get at a physical or have gotten at a physical. And um, uh, those kinds of measurements, a number of different technologies are now emerging where you can make those measurements on a phone. Um, other types of measurements that we, we can make on a phone, um, we've explored a few uh, different varieties of those. Uh, we've gotten curious whether the imaging capabilities of the uh, phone were going to be good enough to serve as, a, as an ophthalmoscope. So um, being able to image the eye, again, is for low resource regions is uh, a challenge because the, the standard Topcon cameras that you sit at uh, when you go to the eye doctor and look into those, uh, those goggles, um, they take beautiful images of your retina, but uh, those are very expensive. So is there a way to, again, use the mass-produced mobile phone cameras and sensors to be able to uh, solve that problem? And we can get reasonably good images of uh, retinas um, as a result of simply coupling ophthalmic lenses with the mobile phone and controlling illumination uh, uh, coming from those ophthalmic lenses. Another application that, uh, that, that is particularly near and dear to my heart is uh, ear infections. So when I was a kid, I would have ear infections all the time. I loved to go swimming, and, and then I would come back and have an ear infection. Um, uh, but apparently, I would wait until I was, uh, it was Friday night, uh, everything was closed, and then I would uh, note that my ear was really hurting, and then I'd proceed to scream and whatever. And so that made it, it an emergency room visit to go and check into, is there an ear infection? It, it, should antibiotics be prescribed? Um, so uh, um, a, a student lab, Eric Douglas, uh, uh, developed this into a real device um, and um, uh, one that is you can use at home to be able to image uh, the ear. Because when you go to that emergency room, the emergency room physician sticks an otoscope in your ear and simply looks. Does it look red? How red does it look? Uh, there, there's no actual physical measurement taken. There's nothing, uh, in most cases, not a... Uh, interaction with the eardrum, it's usually just an image. And so why can't we just send that image, get that evaluated, and then get a prescription, if any, uh, sent back? And so that's the approach uh, used here. But in, in developing this, Eric uh, did something that is now possible with mobile phones, which is collect lots and lots of data. Just like all the images you have stored on your phone, if it's easy to take those images, then you end up taking lots and lots. And so he ended up with, I think, the world's largest database of ear images. Um, and those, those databases can be put to good use, um, train algorithms. Uh, they can also be put to really bad uses. Um, and th this is what uh, Eric uh, made uh, for one of the art shows that we do. We put on one every year. And he, that was his contribution one year, was uh, from ear images uh, to, to make other uses of them. Maybe I'll end with uh, a perspective on how these devices can, can teach us more. Um, this is a use of uh, one of the earlier devices um, uh, by an organization. It's an educational organization in Hawaii. And they would bring these out on boats. Um, and they would scoop water samples up and then look at them. And the images they collected were extraordinary uh, to me. I, I, I hadn't seen images like these. And they really bring home the the vibrancy of life around us <clears throat> and the, the, the amazing organisms that are uh, uh, all around us, if only we could see them, um, if only we could uh, interact with them, uh, observe them, and maybe having low-cost instruments, having them readily available, will make it easier for us to, to enjoy uh, the, the beauty of nature that's around us. And that's a lot of what I think MBL does so well is bringing that beauty to life, bringing that, uh, that foreignness of the world around us to make it feel a little bit more like home. So maybe we can all answer this question of what do, what do we have? What do we have around us by having more microscopes, by having them more accessible, by having them be easy to use? So I'll, I'll end with that. Um, I think in the future, these things are going to be uh, much more useful uh, for informing our health um, and much more able to uh, guide us in terms of early detection of diseases, um, guide us in terms of our decision making about health. Uh, and uh, none of this, none of these ideas would have been possible without the fantastic uh, group that I get to work with, 
Uh, um, a number of the people uh, whose projects I talked about are, are in this image um, and others aren't. Uh, but I uh, thank you for your attention and be happy to answer any questions. I was kind of wondering if this had an interesting way to redeploy all those phones that get traded in. It is. Um, if you've got any you want to give me now, that would be fine. Uh, it, it, so it's a really good point. Um, the, the phone that we've been using um, in Cameroon for a number of years, which is perfectly sufficient for uh, quantifying the number of Loa Loa worms, is an iPhone 5S. Um, and some of you might even still have one in a drawer somewhere um, unused. But those are perfectly usable. The imaging system works well enough. It's, the processing is slow compared to what it can do now. But um, yes, old phones are still good at imaging some things, just like old microscopes are still good at imaging some things. Hi, I'm sorry, I'm just going to pick on you for a second. I'm an astrophysicist, and um, so, of course, we do imaging up, steps down, and um, uh, it could be useful to explain to everybody what makes an iPhone different from a charge-coupled device. We're talking about electrons here. So, so uh, explain what, what makes an iPhone different from a, from a what? What makes a charge couple device different from an iPhone? Ah, uh, from a CMOS versus a CCD. Yes, yes. Um, so, yeah, they're all electrons, as you say. All the signal, the photons are, are, are converted into uh, to electrons, uh, but the, the, the architecture of that, uh, that sensor is, uh, is, is, is different. Um, the, the, CMOS, uh, uh, the CMOS approach uh, for for designing that and for manufacturing that can make those sensors much lower, much more low cost than the old CCDs, which are still you know again those are still useful, but their manufacture was more costly. CMOS devices can be made in all silicon foundries, and that allows us to mass produce them and keep costs really really low. Great point. Uh, so one of the examples that you use during your slide is to have, like, say, um, with an ear infection, the guardian of, like, say, a child patient um, set, take a picture of the ear and use that device to magnify what's within the ear and send it over to the doctor. So my question is, will this device be of use? For the general public, or is it meant to just be in hospitals? Oh, that's one question. Sorry, I have a second one. Um, <laughs> what is the drawback of using this device? Uh, two good questions. Um, so, number one, it's not intended just for uh, for hospitals, although um, that ends up being uh, useful to be able to show a picture to a parent. Um, or a caregiver, you know, here's the problem. Uh, uh, it's it's red, but it's not red over here. Or if you have sequential images, see it's getting less red. Um, that anecdotally, at least, has led to fewer requests for antibiotics, which is another topic of uh, not over-prescribing antibiotics when they're not necessarily. You don't know if it's a viral infection or a bacterial infection. Um, so being able uh, to show images and to track images are going to be helpful both in the clinic and at home. Um, uh, so, so this is intended for use by, uh, by us um, and by anyone who, who has the capacity to, to do that imaging uh, in the ear. So it's not something that requires a lot of training, but you know, to your question about risk, what are the, what are the disadvantages or what are the risks of this? Um, you know, anytime you're sticking something in an ear, whether it's a Q-tip or the, the tip of an otoscope, there's always the risk of doing something, doing harm. And so I think there's, there's got to be fail-safes built into these uh, images, uh, these imaging devices, to try and prevent um, misuse or accidental harm that comes from them. 
So those, any kind of medical device, I think, um, has to go through this process. Uh, that has gone through an FDA clearance. Um, so it needs to be evaluated for the kind of questions you're asking, which is what are the, what are the risks? Uh, first off, as a Cal grad, I'm, I'm happy to see great research still done at Cal. <laughs> And right on, go Bears. This, this is yeah, go Bears. This is kind of stuff they hit, they hit me up for every time they ask for money. <laughs> I, I have two questions kind of related to the last one. Um, first off, when you talk about some of these older phones don't have the same amount of processing power, are you looking at doing like like distributed processing using the internet or like a cloud application or something? Uh, yeah, interesting idea. Um, I hadn't been, because we think about these applications mostly in areas where there isn't any Wi-Fi or very poor cellular networks. So we need all the image processing to happen on the phone so that the device um, for the worm uh, in particular, that that can happen um, entirely on the device and not need any connectivity whatsoever. Um, so that's a self-contained. All the data that it's collecting can then be uploaded uh, to a network, to the cloud, and, and it is once there is Wi-Fi or cellular signal. Um, but it needs to be able to operate and give an answer without any connectivity. Uh, conversely, are there any concerns about uh, data privacy? Yes, lots of concerns about that. Uh, way above my pay grade. Um, uh, I think those are true for, for all of our phones and hopefully we can ride the wave as we have done for the sensor quality. Uh, we can also ride the wave with improvements in uh, security on phones. Hi, I was just wondering if you think there's like a future where phones can do like video micro, like not just like sequential images, but like actual like video um, like intake. And if like instead of just using the capillaries, there could be some way to like find like tissue samples or like MRI kind of stuff and like imaging that's a little bit more advanced than just like the bending of light and yep. stuff. Uh, great question. So where, like where, what's the future look like? Um, I'm bullish on the ability of phones to do many more things. Um, I think it doesn't, it's not limited to just a single uh, section. I think um, uh, with enough computational power, you can uh, begin to image in 3D. Um, there are uh, I interesting possibilities when it comes to uh, additional sensors. Uh, what I really like is for someone to, to make a phone that's more health phone oriented or a science phone oriented that has bare sensors without the lenses um, so that I can put whatever lenses I want on there. Um, but take the user interface, the computational power, but give me more access to the, to the sensor. Um, so I think many, many things can be done with light. Uh, there already are devices that you can attach to a phone uh, that allow you to do ultrasound. So peripherals that extend the ability to, uh, to do imaging, do imaging with other modalities, uh, I think those are, those are all coming. So I think the future is very much about uh, these portable and I would say distributed uh, healthcare, where we're not going to the hospital each time we want to learn something. We're going to have a, a little Bluetooth box in our house or at work or at a school, and that's going to be the thing where we make a lot of measurements, and that is going to be then distributed, stored. Uh, security becomes an issue, of course, but uh, I think that's a, a going to bring that, the measurements closer to us. Just one, possibly two more questions. In the audience. So the big purpose of this is to make, you know, these diagnoses much more accessible to people in under-resourced areas. And I guess another piece of it is, you know, you don't need physicians, you don't necessarily need nurses. Could lower skilled, less expensive folks, you know, collect these samples and could they, you know, analyze them? Or the phone could actually, through maybe uh, machine learning or something like that, could be used to make a diagnosis, at least a preliminary diagnosis in some of these under-resourced areas. Precisely. I think you hit upon exactly uh, a key goal of this effort, and I think other efforts, is to reduce the requirement for skilled uh, personnel. Um, and, and actually, for this device that detects the wiggling worm, um, our, our partners in Cameroon have, have done an evaluation of how much training is required. Um, so not nurses and doctors, but 
uh, minimally trained healthcare workers, how much training is required for them to uh, uh, operate it safely and accurately. And it was, you know, under half a day of training. Um, so that's part of what we can offload is some of the expertise required to normally handle samples, um, put that into the automation and the image processing uh, to, en to enable this to be used in broader areas without the requirement for that expertise. Exactly, exactly. And I wouldn't mind that here too. You know, I think a, a, a broader goal is that if we can solve problems and demonstrate that technologies are safe and useful in places where uh, they're urgently needed, then in places where maybe they're not urgently needed, like here, but it's just much more expensive to do the alternative, which means some are not getting access to that, maybe we can change the, the way that healthcare is delivered in the U.S. as well. We have uh, time for one more question in the back. Thank you. Um, great talk. Um, I just have two questions. You mentioned that uh, for the use of this device in the U.S., you need FDA approval. And you've mentioned that you have partners all over the world. And I wonder what the regulatory issues you might be facing. And I guess thinking about potential uh, groups in different places that might see the utility for this type of application, uh, is there any IP restriction on the use of, the, of this? Or will can they just contact your lab and, you know, form a partnership or how does this work? Yeah, two great questions. So one about uh, the requirements um, and two about availability. Um, so first on the requirements. Uh, so, so far we've only done studies in places. These are not being sold anywhere. Um, and so in order for something to be sold, it needs to go through, at least in the US, the FDA approval. Um, for doing a study um, uh, in Cameroon, for example, we needed to get uh, Ministry of Health approval. And so that involves a, a process of explaining the, 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 the technology, the need, et cetera. So it does go through an approval process. It's just a very different one than here in the US. Eventually, if this is going to be broadly available, then there will need to be a regulatory approval um, uh, in, in those countries where they're used as well. In terms of uh, accessibility, um, uh, I think we're always interested in piloting new applications. So. Um, uh, uh, we're eager to, to talk with people where we could provide a technology that would be useful. Um, in terms of IP, uh, there is IP on it, but it's owned by UC Berkeley, and UC Berkeley has, uh, I think, a very progressive view on uh, making technology available for uh, low-resource regions, and so there are no, no royalties uh, associated with that. So there, it's, it's the IP system at Berkeley is it's set up with the explicit intent to make technologies that can benefit low resource regions uh, broadly available. Thank Professor Fletcher. Thank you.